Welcome wrestling fans, welcome to Curtain Jerkin. As always, I'm your host, Jacob Grandi, reporting for the Main Event Marks YouTube channel. You can also check me out on Spotify. However you're listening to my voice, I appreciate it. We're going to be talking about New Japan, WWE, AEW, TNA. We're going to be talking about it all, and we're going to get to some news first. Some news that saddens me, but... Um, you know, you gotta stay positive here. Okada leaving New Japan Pro Wrestling. A statement put out from New Japan Pro Wrestling. Last match uh, with Tanahashi apparently will be February 11th. Last match uh, in New Japan for the foreseeable future will be on the set of shows that are going to take place February 23rd and 24th. If not on both shows, on one of those shows, uh, Okada will wrestle. Um, this is crazy. This is crazy. Um, I feel like I've been I've been really watching New Japan Pro Wrestling since Wrestle Kingdom Nine, where we saw Tanahashi and Okada. Where Tanahashi beat Okada, Okada leaving crying, with you know Gato taking him to the back. Crazy, crazy scene. And since that time, we've seen you know AJ leave. We've uh, Prince Devitt. You know, Finn Balor had left right prior to that, um, and then o- and then Omega left, and then Switchblade Jay White left, and throughout that whole time, you know, uh, Okada was the man. He was, you know, there a constant. He was, you know, the guy with the title, the guy to beat for the title, the guy to beat to solidify your success in New Japan was Okada during this whole time. During the peak period of, you know, 2016 to around 2019, I would say, um, you, we saw Okada take the reins over Tanahashi. We saw Tanahashi start to age. We've kind of realized now that Naito won't be long forever, around forever. Um, and here is Okada doing the same thing that we've seen those guys I just previously mentioned go. Will he go to AEW? Apparently, he has an agent that a lot of people for AEW have and we know with Will Ospreay signing with AEW that Tony Khan lets you live wherever you want to live and work for AEW so it kind of makes more sense that he would go to AEW rather than WWE but if I was WWE I would sign him I would pick him up uh, you know if nothing more than, than just to have a a, a big big star that you kept from AEW you would have a big Royal Rumble well oh yeah it doesn't it doesn't line up to be in the Royal Rumble but you definitely have a big WrestleMania 40 um, wrestler ca- a character to put into play that would get international appeal you you know you could do a Nakamura Okada match you could do a Cody Okada match you could do CM Punk um, all kinds of matches race through your head just being an Okada fan having him go to WWE you also as an Okada fan you wouldn't have such a packed roster of wrestlers to, for him to compete with I mean look at Jay White Jay White was you know a guy who was holding world titles in New Japan now he's a part of a faction that just combined with another faction to wrestle a faction for a bunch of set of tag team titles so I as an Okada fan, I would rather have him stay in New Japan forever, but since that's obviously not the case, I'd rather have him in WWE. Speaking of someone going from New Japan to probably WWE, Tama Tonga, uh, he's leaving Japan. He dropped the Never title to Evil, and uh, he got pretty emotional when leaving the ring. And then it hits you like he's been around for like 14 years, and all of those 14 years was <clears throat> in New Japan. His brother, you know, was the uh, all-star recruit Division One at Missouri uh, playing in SEC football. And then he's the guy that WWE wanted. So he got to compete in NXT when NXT was at his infancy. That entire time, Tamatanga went to Japan, went up through the dojo system, happened to fall into the most successful faction in the last 20 years in Bullet Club, worked up the ranks of Bullet Club, wrestled in these G1s as a lower to mid Carter, to now, I would say he's like definitely, you can make an argument that he's like top five stars in 
New Japan right now, now leaving to go west. Uh, I can understand why he's a little teary-eyed about it. New Japan had his back when you know it looked like the wrestling world didn't really want to work with him. Uh, but I can understand why he wants to go as well. I mean, this guy looks like a million bucks. Will probably make a lot of money in WWE. Uh, I can see him, you know, coming right along. Hopefully, he does better than uh, the Good Brothers have recently. But speaking of WWE, Seth Rollins, their uh, world champion, her the Raw world champion, uh, injured, uh, tore his MCL in a match with Jinder Mahal. Uh, this hurts WrestleMania. He's going to be out past WrestleMania. So you know, the CM Punk match we all wanted is gone. Uh, what are they going to do with this? I think they should have hot shot it a long time ago. They had Punk since November. They had Rollins, uh, probably with more critical acclaim than he has ever had, and they didn't pull the trigger in December. And it looked like they weren't going to do it for for Royal Rumble either. But that's neither here nor there. Rollins is you know probably gonna be better by SummerSlam. We'll get the punk match at SummerSlam. But what's gonna happen here now that he's gone? We'll probably find out on Raw tonight. I'm recording this noon on Monday. But that does leave a big gaping hole on Monday Night Raw. But speaking of Rollins versus Jinder, uh, that there's a lot of discourse with Rollins versus Jinder versus Hook versus Joe and whether Jinder or Hook was better, which is a, a crazy question in you know the year of 2024 to who is better, Hook or Jinder Mahal. I mean, I think these both were great TV matches, watching them both. Not a big show main events, but the story they told were good. And they got wrestlers involved that aren't usually on the top spot of the show. So this is great. A lot of discourse online. But these two matches were good and served a purpose, and I enjoyed a lot of them. Uh, but you know, I like a lot of uh, you know I like a lot of wrestling. You don't have to convince me to watch wrestling. I love a five star match. I love a Tokyo Dome main event. But it seems like that happening more and more uh, nowadays has kind of made people and me miss just some good old fashioned wrestling, story based wrestling, Memphis style wrestling, Mid Atlantic style wrestling that tells a story more than just has a lot of moves uh, and I think those two matches both told great stories which in the three ring circus that should be a wrestling show you need a match like that in between uh, the five star classics that's just what I think so I think when people are just like wh who's better gender or hook it's kind of ridiculous because one they're on two different shows and they both serve different purposes. You know, Joe was supposed to be the dominant champion wrestling a guy who has a lot of heart. Rollins was supposed to be wrestling having that heart going up against, you know, a powerhouse in Jinder Mahal who towers over him and has two even bigger guys standing around ringside. It's two different things that told great stories. But let's go into, you know, the week that was Talking about SmackDown, universal title match, contract signing, all three challengers out there, but we were missing the Tribal Chief. Heyman out there not trying to sign the contract for Reigns. After everyone is out there already ready to sign the contract, Nick Alda said, okay, fine then, bitch, you're vacating the fucking championship. I'm paraphrasing, of course, and that's when Heyman you know, had a second thought, and through this little exchange, we got L.A. Knight versus A.J. Styles, and also Randy Orton versus Solo Sokoa. But the L.A. versus A.J. match, uh, Jimmy Uso makes his way to the ringside, but it was Solo who ran in and attacked both men, hits A.J. with the Samoan spike, asks for the mic, so he got a little mic time from Solo. Two down, one to go, calls out Orton. Randy versus Solo. Randy dropping him on the announce desk. Jimmy comes out again. But it's L.A. Knight that meets him at the top of the ramp, along with A.J. Styles, to make sure he doesn't interfere. RKO to Solo, 1-2-3. A.J. and L.A. Knight come into the ring to maybe celebrate, maybe size them up, who knows. L.A. Knight gets, uh, gets RKO'd. A.J. Styles gets RKO'd. Reigns comes out of nowhere with the Superman punch, and he cackles and stands over all three men as if he did... The damage to knock out all three men. And he signs the contract 
tries to spear Randy, but get hit with an RKO himself, and Randy Orton stands tall, knocking out Solo, knocking out AJ, knocking out LA Knight, and the Tribal Chief Roman Reigns. I'm hyped up, as you can tell. This match is going to be is going to be good. Another match that's going to be good, Logan Paul versus Kevin Owens. They had a face-to-face, -face, simple booking, but great delivery from both men. Uh, KO attacks him. Logan Paul injures the hand. KO using, uh, uses, injures the hand of KO using the steps. Uh, this, yeah, Like I said, this is going to be a good match, but this build is kind of put me to sleep here. I don't care about this cast on KO's arm. LWO versus Legato Del Fantasma. Solid six man. No one got launched into the air from LWO like on NXT, which is a bummer. Backstabber by Carlito, but not to the legal man. Escobar rolls him up one, two, three, and gets the victory. Steals one for his team. Pete Dunn and Tyler Bate versus Pretty Deadly. Uh, it seems like they're pushing, you know, Pete Dunn and Tyler Bate. Uh, a lot. It was ridiculous to hear the announcer try to explain why Pete Dunn was Butch for a long time, but now he's Pete Dunn, but it's obviously the same guy. I don't know why they didn't just keep that character with him. Yeah, Tyler Bates, great. Pete Dunn is great. But having a little gimmick with them, having them be these uh, brawlers from the UK, like, you know, you know, potentially soccer fans that, you know, hooligans, I think it would be a great gimmick, something we really haven't seen a lot in, you know, American wrestling at least. And I think that that could have, you know, at, made the champion them even more so over in the UK. They wrestled some other guys from the UK pretty deadly uh, who haven't done shit lately in months. And uh, Pete Dunne and Tyler Bay get the victory. Women's tag champions making their way from Raw to SmackDown here. Going up against Alba Fire and Isla Dawn. Damage control at ringside. Are the new champs going up against the mainstays of, like, damage control? I think they are. Uh... They win the match, and then the Kabuki Warriors of Damage Control get in the ring, start dancing around with their titles, and they didn't really do too much here, but uh, Bailey's just like, I think that we're going to get a title match at the Royal Rumble, so she kind of just does the work for WWE here, and uh, we lazily booking, but great match, I guess that might be the theme of the Royal Rumble this year, uh, have a solid women's tag team match on this show, so I think, yeah, Logan Paul versus Kevin Owens. The Kabuki Warriors versus Chance and Carter. The four-way match. And two Royal Rumble matches. This show is stacked. And it's looking pretty good. Uh, looking pretty good is NXT the past few weeks, in my opinion. The Dusty Rhodes Classic is underway. This is big. Tag Team Wrestling has kind of stalled out in AEW, in my opinion. Uh, after years of being on top of this style of wrestling. Don't get me wrong. AW has great tag teams, but the titles are kind of tied in with this Jericho thing, which is kind of a mess, and it's four singles competitors fighting for the tag team championship, where these are all tag teams. Trick and Carmelo versus uh, Idris Inofi and Malik Blade. Hopefully I said that all right. I don't know these two other guys. I don't uh, watch a lot of uh, Level Up, um, but these guys are running around nearly killing themselves in this dusty inspired gear diving all over the place so i'm interested in these guys and i looked them up a little bit the enough after training and level up wrestling school an actual school not a play on the nxt show in california has been signed for three years to wwe malik blade been signed for about as long but came up in the indies in florida so Keep up with these guys. I I know I am. I didn't know, but now I know. Trick and Carmelo get the win. We all chant, whoop that trick, and we all are enjoying ourselves on NXT for doing that. I love whoop that trick. You know, you I chant it all the time. It gets stuck in my head. I love it almost as Booker T loves it. Trick and Carmelo talking in the back. Dragon off walks in. He always comes across as a guy who is on the brink of a breakdown. And it's interesting to see how beloved he is with such an odd character on a show that's kind of character-based like NXT. He wants to go up against Trick at Vengeance Day. Trick agrees, but that is the same day as the finals for the Dusty Classic. So Carmelo not happy about that. Trick wants to wrestle twice. He's a workhorse. The crowd gets the whoop that shit Trick chanted. 
uh, a total of four times possibly. It works for the like the yes movement at Mania three. I think that he can have two matches the same night, just like Brian da- uh, Daniel Bryan did at WrestleMania three. We had a uh, Duke Hudson and Riley Osborne versus LWO for the Dusty Classic. Of course, Duke and Osborne representing Chase U. They're broke, but they're not broken. Osborne looking smooth in the ring here. Duke doing some dusty strikes in the classic. You gotta love it. Piped in crowd. Took me out of it, though. Cruz hits the Phoenix Splash. One, two, three. LWO advances. And then we had some WWE main stars, main main roster talent making their way to NXT. Always something of note. JBL talking to Josh Briggs. Kind of boring. Baron Corbin talking to... Braun Breaker here, they're teaming up here. This was kind of funny here. What do they call themselves? Like the the Wolf Dogs? Braun not happy with the name. Everyone else is happy with the name. I would say like checking Twitter during the show. This was the one thing that people were laughing at, having a good time. I was personally laughing at Baron Corbin looking a lot like Billy Corgan of uh, NWA fame here. William Patrick himself. Uh, They got the similar style. You got to tell me in the comments who wears it better. Laya Valkyrie and Tatum Paxley versus Lola Vice and Electra Lopez. Beautiful spin kick here, taking out Paxley, but she's being she, uh, being the legal man, not being the legal man. Uh, the other one sneaks in there. One, two, three. Solid little finish here, but it was a lot like the El Fantasma match on SmackDown. Women's Battle Royal here. Kalani lands on the table, and she does the cool looking like. Don't put your feet on the floor Kofi Kingston spot, but she doesn't botch it like Kofi's done in recent years Vice saving Lopez, but Lopez throwing out Vice and shaking her ass while doing it Special meter building up here for the ass shake then Lopez gets eliminated. They both brawl to the black back Blair Davenport gets eliminated acts like a complete bitch about it assaulting the women who are still competing in the match who then gets eliminated. Grace celebrates like she did something here before getting thrown out herself. I have been watching NXT again for a few months now, a little while now, and I feel like I don't know a lot of these women until I saw this battle royal. All of them have personalities, and I think that was good. This all led to a a four-way, and this battle royal was um, different in that sense because the four-way is just a standard four-way. One lady gets pins and gets the win. Uh, Henley, Roxanne, Kiana James, and uh, Kalani Jordan, who I'm unfamiliar with. She's in this one. Roxanne wins, cashes in her ticket to go up against Valkyrie at Vengeance Day. So Roxanne Perez and Layla Valkyrie in this Vengeance Day pay-per-view, they're setting up. I do want to talk about Omi Femi cutting a promo in the ring that has that WWE delivery talking like this. Then Dragon Lee comes out. I hope Dragon Lee kind of just moves on to SmackDown. I've wanted this the whole time, but he seems to be tied in with this uh, North American Championship in NXT. Coffee versus Holland. NXT UK lives in 2024 on the NXT program. Gallus drops him and tells him that he has no friends left. Uh, what a what a sad sight to see. This kind of hurt my feelings here for old Ridge Holland. Uh, you know, Sheamus is out, and then. His buddy Butch is now a completely other different person on another show. Uh, Trey Barhill, he looked pretty impressive versus Dijak, a uh, monster of a man, two years in the wrestling uh, industry. Dijak hits him with a big boot, one, two, three, then gets attacked from Gracie. They brawl to the back. Lexus King attacks Barhill again after Barhill attacked him because Lexus attacked him, taking him out of the breakout tournament. The breakout tournament is won already, but these guys aren't finished with one another. Let's jump over to AEW Dynamite here. Uh, Darby wrestling Jeff Hardy on Rampage. That was good. I wrote this in my notes before I actually watched the match, so we'll get into that a little later. Christian versus Dusty Rhodes on Sunday Night Heat. Uh, No, it was on Dynamite for the TNT title. Dustin hitting the code red as always. Awesome. Uh, Christian cuts him off with a dive and then drops him on the neck on the top rope. That was you know a nice little old school spot. Nick Wayne gets involved to no avail. Shattered Dreams, Suplex, Crossroads, 1-2. No, Christian kicks out. Dustin hits a Destroyer on Nick Wayne. Kill Switch. 
And that's how you let the beat build, bitch. But no, Dustin kicks out. He hits it yet again. One, two, three. Christian retains. Cassidy and Trent versus Pinta and Commander. Commander is great, but I don't like how they're just plugging him in to Phoenix here. I feel like Phoenix and Pinta are great, but they're also good on their own. Um, so, you know, just plugging Commander in here, it doesn't sit right with me a little bit. Um, then, you know, Cassidy gets the win here. The Undisputed Kingdom come out. Roddy wants an international title or international title shot. Cassidy says, let's go. They're about to go right then and there. But no, no, no. They hold off for March 3rd. Asshole chance fill the air. I'm excited about this because I will be in attendance March 3rd. This is going to be a great match. Uh, Mark talking about, uh, or Mark Briscoe talking about his brother here. Trying to make me cry. Hard to believe it's been a year. Uh, a year ago, it seemed like everyone was crying but Mark Briscoe. But then when Mark Briscoe did this delivery, uh, he looked like he was tearing up a bit here. So, you know, hang in there, man. Hang in there. Uh, but he did recover. And then they did a you know a very well-done video package on, on Jay Briscoe. Really trying to make me cry with that one. And then we go to the back for a Young Buck sit-down interview with Renee Paquette. Nicholas and Matthew Jackson sitting there. Uh, I should say, uh, uh, leaning into what people are saying about them online, wearing suits, having shitty mustaches, um, you know, acting like they've taken their job too seriously, uh, selfish, self-serving superstars. They're calling, uh, you know, people that are coming from the WWE over to AEW, and then they uh, want to wrestle Sting, and not because of what Sting has done, but what he represents. Uh, I love this shit. I think this is great here. I think this is great characters um, because it's who people see them as turned up to 11. So I think a lot of times people say, be who you are turned up to 11. But sometimes in today's world, if you want to be a heel in wrestling, at least you can, you know, be what people perceive you as. It's a dangerous road to go down, but then you can get success from that, set up good storylines from that. And I think this is what the Young Bucks are doing here. And I, I I like it. I like it. Mogul Embassy versus the uh, Gun Club. ROH six-man tag titles on the line. Colton playing a little back uh, basketball here. I liked how he hit the cutter. Nana tries to interfere. Anthony Bowens comes down and stops him. And then the Bullet Club win the six-man tag titles from the ROH six-man tag titles. But there is obvious tension here with who is the best trios team. And we'll get to that a little later of what happens here Bowens wants the gun club to join them. Jay White a little apprehensive about it. Anna J versus Deanna Perrazzo. Time was Tony Storm at ringside. Backstabber from Anna. Deanna Perrazzo kicks out. Perrazzo taps out Anna J. And then she calls out the champ. Tony gets on Luther's shoulders in a hilarious fashion. And, uh, you know, pretty much gets, you know, after saying, you know, some funny promo here kind of walks to the back kind of ignoring Perazzo, but also you can tell there's only one way they're going to go with this feud this is going to be good top flight versus private party this should have been an roh pre-show match or something like that like pre-show for an roh show this is a big match too uh i would say staples of aw tag division here going at it for the first time i thought this you know could have been built a little better mark quinn is back and diving around back and forth but he is wrestling with a shirt on so you know he he ain't in shape like he used to be but he looks the part here diving on everybody hitting a 450 one two no gin and juice didn't get the pin but then they roll him up one two three and they get the pin action andretti saw uh what we all saw which was uh you know a little a little cheating here using the ropes a little bit but the ref didn't see it and south carolina was too busy dancing to care so like you know private party is supposed to be the heels but that song kicks in shots 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 the crowd is dancing they forgot about the match i don't know if that went the exact way they wanted it to go but you do know that the song is over and in 2024 that's half the battle get that song over people will like it when you come out and then hopefully you can do some in-ring action that will hook them speaking of hook hook versus joe hook in control on the outside joe fights him off and throws him with a nasty urinagi 
onto the announcer's desk, but it seems like they hit the edge of the announcer's desk more so than like fully on top of the announcer's desk like you usually see. Uh, that looked bad. Hook gives him the double bird. Joe continues to kill him. Apron bomb on Hook's bitch ass. Joe hits a wait. Uh, Joe just waiting in the ring. Hook beats the count, continues to kill him. Hook not quitting. Muscle Buster, one count. The people are starting to believe. Hook hits an exploder. I'm starting to believe. They are chanting his name here. Choke. Joe counters it. And then reality sets in as Hook goes night night. We were fools. We were all fooled by the heart of Hook here, thinking that he could beat the, the champion as Joe retains. Solid match here. Joe hits a muscle buster at the end. Hook gets up. Joe frustrated. Then Hangman Page comes out and chases the shark away from the water, lets the minnow swim upstream for just a little longer in Hook, but then behind Adam Page, Swerve's creepy ass, smiling at him as Action Bronson plays off air. This is a great little segment here. This was a great match. I love the where they're going with Joe, with the looming feud of Hangman Page and Swerve kind of tied into this. Uh, I think that... Swerve and Hangman have a certain kind of chemistry that could go a lot of places. So you get the title involved in that feud, and it could go places. I think I was telling my friend Kenny, uh, beginning half of the year they should do this, and it seems to be the way that they're going. AEW Rampage, Jericho versus Seidel. Nice little pairing here. Always good to see Seidel. Codebreaker, 1-2, no. Lion Salt, Seidel gets his knees up. Hurricane Rana from Jericho. Judas Effect, 1-2-3. But Jericho celebrates going up the ramp. Takeshita attacks him. And we have, you know, some more Callus family versus Jericho feud action happening here. Penta versus Anthony Henry. So I didn't like the commander pairing on Dynamite. It looks like my prayers were answered. We have a Penta singles match. DVD from Henry. Fear Factor from Penta getting solo, getting the solo win here. Uh, they must be listening to me, like I said. Statlander versus Queen uh, Amanita, who is must be making the round. She seems to be popping up on AEW more and more lately. Running hip attack, woo kick. Still can't uh, put away Statlander. Uh, Discus Lariat, Fisherman uh, Michinoku Driver. So that breaks the AEW Michinoku Driver rule because it wasn't a two count, uh, but it was a Fisherman Michinoku Driver. So that little tweak that Statlander did got her the victory. If she didn't do that Fisherman Michinoku Driver hooking the leg a little bit more, it would have been a two count. We know that from every other match in AEW history. Then... Jeff Hardy versus Darby Allen for the second time. You got to love this one. Someone called the EMTs. They ring the bell. Darby is just killing himself, diving onto chairs. Neck breaker on the apron from Jeff. Swanton, but nobody home. Jeff goes through a table. Darby gets out of the way. Back in the ring, uh, Darby rolls up Jeff. One, two, three. Darby and Jeff have a mutual show of respect for one another, but Darby wants the fist bump. Jeff doesn't give him the fist bump. So what's going to happen there, we don't know. I know that Jeff Hardy's wrestling Swerve on Dynamite. So Jeff Hardy's been kind of outspoken about not wrestling on Dynamite. Here he is wrestling one of the biggest, hottest stars right now as he is a legend on Dynamite. This should be good. In the wake of Swerve beating the shit out of Dustin, an old school legend who paints his face from WWE uh, last month on the pay-per-view. So this should be a good one. And then we're going to go into AEW Collision. Big news leaving the show is the Bang Bang Gang, Switchblade, Jay White, and the Gun Club join uh, the acclaimed. And they make the Bang Bang Scissor Gang. I think, you know, this is all in fun. This is funny. You know, two factions that people tend to like are teaming up. But now it's time to get serious. Let them go up against uh, the Undisputed Kingdom and put both pairs of six-man and trios championships on the undisputed kingdom so they have all the belts they look cool coming out with all the belts and adam cole you know cutting those great promos as they sit there in all the gold i think this is good i think this is what you should do um if you're trying to put this faction over uh what you should do if you're trying to put shane taylor over is have him wrestle john moxley left hand lariat at is connected here in this matchup that took place. Uh, took Moxley down, leading to some strikes. Moriarty on the outside in an old school Dennis Rodman shirt, cheering on Shane Taylor. 
Both men still firing shots. Huge knee from Mox. And another one. One, two. Shane kicks out. Rear naked choke. Lee, or excuse me, Shane taps out. Um, the really good shot here of Lee Moriarty realizing what's going to happen, realizing it's over. Um, I thought that was kind of the best part of the match here. And then we go into Adam Copeland versus Dante Martin. Copeland going after the ear. Martin uh, flying around. One, two, Copeland uh, gets his leg on the rope. A lady in the crowd couldn't believe it, but of course we all could believe it. Avalanche Sunset flip from Dante, but Copeland hits Dante with a spear in midair. And then the grindhouse, which is more like a cross face. Dante taps out. So both matches in a row here kind of told the same story. An up-and-comer wrestling an established star who then they get them to tap out. So, I mean, I know I'm nitpicky here, but they could have spaced these matches out um, a little better. Thunder Rosa versus Queen Amida. Uh, hopefully I'm saying that correctly. Excuse me if I'm not. Uh, run Running hip attack. Uh, Air Raid Crash, 1-2, Thunder Rosa kicks out. Taiwan Bomb, 1-2-3, Thunder Rosa gets the victory. Uh, Matthews versus Garcia, 205 Live champion versus a guy who wrestled on 205 Live as an enhancement talent. Five years later, they wrestling as equals on AEW Collision. Garcia going after uh, the leg. Figure four around the ring post. Bret Hart was probably proud watching this at home and then he goes in and locks in the sharpshooter but he wrenches back so much that Matthews is able to grab his head and get free of this hold knee deadlift jackhammer Garcia still dancing showing heart but Matthews getting frustrated here ends up getting rolled up one two three Garcia steals the victory house of black FDR, they start brawling immediately. Refs come out. Security comes out. The locker room comes out. You got to love the old school locker room clearing brawl here. Um, and this is all going to lead to an elimination steel cage match. Lots of uh, faction cage matches happening. You know, you got that one in New Japan with Osprey and, uh, and Finley. And then you got this one here with uh, the House of Black versus FTR. Roderick Strong versus Matt Seidel. Weren't these guys in the, the Vulture Squad together? Um, I was saying in Vulture Squad, but then Kevin Kelly corrected me. It was Generation Next in ROH back in the day. Roderick Strong gets the victory. All going into the main event here. Kingston and Ortiz versus Danielson and Claudio. Ortiz gets caught in the swing and ends up getting the yes kicks. They're playing the hits on this guy's bitch ass. Ortiz needs to tag. He gets one. No love lost here between Claudio and Kingston. They're teeing off on each other. The strike battle leads to bitch slaps, which leads to kibashi chops. Exploder. Claudio hits a choke slam, believe it or not. Danielson has uh, the bell lock on Ortiz. Claudio holding Kingston back. Ortiz gets caught in the ropes. Uh, like Claudio just like kind of like flaps like the ropes on uh, Kingston's, you know, nutsack here a little bit and that that was kind of a cool spot that uh, i was listening to alvarez and alvarez mentioned that they weren't even uh they weren't even talking about this spot i thought that spot you know was one of the best spots of the the match here but psycho knee one two three blackpool combat get the victory brian then spits at the face of eddie kingston here we will see where this goes brian wanted that triple crown didn't get the triple crown it now sits on eddie K kingston's trophy case Will we get Brian versus Kingston March 3rd? I think we will. I usually don't talk about this show, but I'm going to talk about this show because this show had you know quite the makeover here. TNA, uh, Nick Namath, Dolph Ziggler comes out, addresses the world. He's here to show the world that he's on TNA. He wants a title shot, but he respects the locker room too much to just ask for one. So he's, I guess, you know, going to be, you know, wrestling up the card, but then gets interrupted by Steve Maglin. Maglin comes out and he says, no one is going to remember Nick Namath. They'll just ask whatever happened to Dolph Ziggler. Namath then drops his ass, adjusts his coat, and then leaves him laying. That's probably the big news coming out of the show. But the, the thing that I want to talk about is this matchup here easily one of the top 10 matches of the month which is big for a wrestle kingdom month osprey versus josh alexander josh alexander is kind of hidden in tna but he is great he hits a german power bomb into a backbreaker one two osprey kicks out battle on the apron uh 
with a table looming underneath. Osprey hits a tiger driver through the table. Some shit happens to Osprey's back. Uh, but, you know, they, they look past it. Os cutter, not once but twice. One, two. Alexander kicks out. Alexander bleeding here. Osprey, arrogant side coming through. Alexander had enough firing shots. Spanish fly from Osprey. One, two. Alexander kicks out. Osprey can't believe it. Alexander uh, tried to counter the Stormbreaker, but gets hit with a stun dog millionaire instead. And then the shittiest Os cutter ever is connected. Both men down. Goes for an os cutter on the ramp but alexander cuts him off hits a pile driver on the ramp they struggle but they get back in the ring poison rana hidden blade one two no alexander kicks out another hidden blade storm driver 93 one two hell no c4 from alexander counter into a styles clash which is counter into a fucking styles clash from josh alexander one two three josh alexander gets the victory beats will osprey Gets his win back from Osprey. Scott Diamore comes out. He's hyped as shit. I'm hyped as shit. He loses his shit talking about how much he loves TNA. I felt it. I'm going to keep kind of maybe keeping my eye on this a little bit here. See if it gets good. That's what I did with NXT. And now NXT is a staple of what I talk about every week on Curtain Jerkin. As always, I love y'all for listening. Fly high. I'm out.